Hello. Hi. Hi, Parun. Hi. Hi. So everyone's hi. here. We can actually start on time. Yay. Hello. Hi, Tarindu. Are you here with hi, us? Hi, everyone. Yes, I'm. I'm here. Ah, okay. Right. Let me just set up the Facebook Live, and we're good to go. Very good evening to all of you, and good evening to all our attendees as well. Uh, welcome to Tech Life. We'll be talking about technology and how it impacts growing children, especially in this age today. So before we start, I want to give a shout out to our sponsors. Our first sponsor is Sima Sri Lanka, and we have a small video to play right before we start. Our story is one of reimagining. Reimagining who you can be, what you can achieve, and how SEMA can support you. As technology and digital platforms disrupt businesses, we are reimagining what the profession can be. We've updated our syllabus to meet the expectation of employers, ensuring SEMA qualified professionals have the skills to make an impact from day one. Reimagine your career. Contact SEMA Sri Lanka. That was Seema Sri Lanka, our sponsor. So we also have Navaleko College of Higher Studies joining with us today. So here is the commercial. Navaleko College of Higher Studies, in association with Swinburne University of Technology, introduces Sri Lanka's first ever blended learning module. During this ongoing pandemic situation, to ensure our NCHS students' health and security, all our classes will continue in two various methods, such as online classes, where our students have access from anywhere using any device at their convenience, and lectures on campus while following the highest health standards according to the government guidelines. As Navaloka College of Higher Studies is a venture of Navaloka Holdings, we ensure to follow all health and safety guidelines recommended by the government authorities to ensure the safety of our students no matter the cost. This is what makes NCHS the best and safest place to study, even during a pandemic situation. That was Navaloka College of Higher Studies. So without further ado, since we have all the attendees uh, also in Zoom, we can just kick things off. So today your moderator will be Sandra Pereira. He is a LSB graduate and a professional compere, and he will be moderating the discussion on behalf of Chapala today. Sandra, you can go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Parmi. So on behalf of Chocolat, I'd like to welcome all of you to Tech Life, a webinar that is going to be uh, spoken, that we are going to talk about today is uh, a topic that is very pertinent, very important in the current context. That is the impact of technology on growing children with regards, to, with its special regards to the COVID-19 pandemic and the situation that we have in the world right now. Uh, so before we start, I actually uh, would like to give a small word of advice, uh, small words of advice to everybody watching in. If you are watching in and if your children are watching uh, right now, and uh, when it comes to their screen time in general, please make sure your children may be facing uh, headaches or they may get eye strains. And when it comes to screens, please try to reduce screen time, uh, screen time at uh, its very best. And always, always try to follow the 20-20-20 rule. That is uh, every 20 minutes, take a 20 second break and uh, stare at something that is 20 feet away. And uh, that being said, I'd like to introduce today's guests uh, that is uh, none other than the respected individuals that you see on screen right now. Uh, first off, we have Mr. Janit Rodrigo, who is a general manager uh, at uh, Digital, Digital TV, better uh, And also we have Mr. Malinda Alakun, who is a lecturer at NCHS. He's also a YouTuber well known for his show, The Tech Track Show. We also have Ms. Vanessa Van Gramberg, who is a special educator, psychologist, and she is also a lecturer in education and psychology. And finally, we also have Mr. Taridu Vijayvardhana, who is a manager, a stakeholder engagement, pathways and relationships, a management accounting association. A very welcome to all of you. All right. Um, 
that being said, uh, to start things off, I actually have uh, a, a question that uh, is to be directed to uh, Mr. Janit. Uh, following with, uh, Mr. Janita, now, with uh, regards to uh, the children's minds in general, and uh, you have seen, uh, uh, you uh, being in your field of uh, activity as well, uh, what is the difference that you see uh, when it comes to children, in, uh, when it comes to the previous decades of generations that, that existed? compared to the youth that is there now, how has media and social media in general shaped their lives, shaped their mindsets? Yeah. Thanks, Andrew, for the question. I mean, uh, early on, you're making us feel old, uh, asking us about generational gaps. But then, uh, yeah, I mean, honestly, I'm not a child psychologist, so I, I'm answering this question from the point of view of, of digital media and, and, and uh, uh, media uh, platform uh, provider, right? So for me, honestly... I mean, growing up, I mean, I'm sure the rest of the panelists can agree. Internet was a luxury, right? I mean, I remember when I used to go on the internet back then, my father used to stop, uh, you know, sit next to me with a stopwatch because, you know, every time you go online, one, your home line is, is engaged and two, your, your internet bill is quite, you know, uh, expensive, right? So with that, I think from now, since I have staff from, from both these generations, from generation... Uh, uh, X to, you know, the millennials, all of them in my teams. I think one of the main differences I see uh, in terms of kids these days is the fact that I think parents seem to think that just because my kid is online or, or they are on YouTube or they watch stuff on Netflix, they have the technological competency that is required for the jobs of, of today. And unfortunately, what I'm seeing is that is not the case despite having this great privilege of, of access to all of these technologies and, and, and uh, the vast resource base that is the internet, unfortunately, I'm seeing a decrease in technological uh, competency in, in, in kids. Right? So I'm sure we are going to talk on, on, the bo on both sides of the spectrum here, right? The, the adverse effects of technology and, and the internet and what is beneficial. So to start off on a positive note, this evening, I would like to say, I mean, as parents, I think what we should look at is apart from just technological usage, what competencies are my kids learning? I mean, what, what are they learning? Because right now, for, for as far as I mean, if you go through YouTube, I think Malinda can can speak more on this, right? In Sri Lanka and, and abroad, I mean, the comparison between Sri Lanka and abroad, the big, biggest difference is YouTube is always looked at as a as an educational platform because it for it, it supports long form video, right? But in Sri Lanka, what we see is YouTube is primarily used as an education as an entertainment platform, which which is a bad trend, right? And 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 people like Malinda they do great educational shows, so we need more content like that in in order for our, our kids to learn more, obviously. But I feel that as parents, I mean, especially if they if your kids consume content in English, right? Then there are, there are resources that they can use. I mean, I, I'm sure your your later on questions will will address what types of uh, programs as parents you can give kids. Right? You have YouTube kids, you have Netflix kids that are age gated, so that it's safe for the kids. Right? So coming back to your question, I think the main difference I see is despite technological usage and the access to the internet going up. The, between generations, I see a big lack in technological competence, which I think we need to address, especially as a small country like ours. We need our kids to be technologically savvy because we need innovation to go forward. Because, you know, we cannot depend on the traditional industries to go forward as a country. So I think our next generation needs to be far more tech savvy. So in order for that to happen, just giving your kid an iPad, just giving your kid your phone or, or access to the internet is not going to cut it. It has to come from a, a point of learning. That's just what I feel. Thank you, Mr. Janit. I really admire your, uh, uh, appreciate, I appreciate your, uh, how you uh, saw the trend and how you spotted out that even though youth and young people do have access to technology and uh, it does not mean that uh, necessarily that everybody, all the young people are educated as to how they should use it. I really like how you uh, answered that question. So, and uh, moving on, I have a question to the rest of the three panelists, actually a common question. Uh, that is, uh, when it comes to educational systems, especially with the uh, pandemic, we saw a, uh, a boom, if I may, uh, into the technological era in Sri Lanka with uh, 2020 and the pandemic. 
so how has it, uh, especially with uh, all your field, the three of yours uh, fields, uh, how do you think that uh, the education sector has done so far and how effective is uh, online learning, uh, has, has online learning been when it comes to children, students, and in general? Maybe Mr. Malinder can begin. Right. Uh, yes. Uh, for the past two semesters uh, in uh, NCHS, we were doing all the studies, all the lessons uh, online. And at a certain point, like we got a small time window to do some lessons in class, 50% of the lessons in class and 50% online to reduce the student population inside the campus. So uh, my experience so far uh, in our campus, I'm talking about our campus, uh, we have like minimum number of issues because uh, our students, they all have at least a laptop, phone, or some kind of device to connect to internet, and they have good internet connection, and they can afford internet, because in Sri Lanka, the internet is uh, built in such a weird way, uh, <clears throat> like we can't uh, pay a flat rate and get an internet connection, so we are charged by the megabytes and the gigabytes we use, which is crazy, I guess. So uh, back in 2013, in Sri Lanka, when we started using uh, broadband internet for the first time, we had a flat rate. We had a flat rate and fixed uh, throughput, fixed uh, speed. Then we can use as, as much as you want throughout the month. It's not the case anymore. So uh, that was the biggest problem I noticed uh, in this uh, classroom because they are always checking their data meters, how many gigabytes I have left. So at some points I had to innovate and go for different tools. So first uh, we have a built-in tool in Swinburne University of Technology into our learning management system. So it's apparently eating so many gigabytes when we conduct lessons. So I had to uh, buy Zoom license and move to Zoom because apparently Zoom is consuming way less data compared to that tool. So that was the biggest problem. And uh, when it comes to uh, the teaching learning experience, uh, one of the biggest thing I noticed like uh, in every class, we have two different groups of students who are here to like, who are really passionate about what they learn. And the other group uh, is here because they have to be here, right? So uh, maybe their parents are pushing them to go on a certain path. So uh, for that kind of people, so most of the time what they usually do is uh, in Chrome, they go to browser tab, right click, mute tab, uh, mute microphone, shut down the camera and they just go ahead and do whatever they want. But uh, they, don't, they, they can't really do such a thing when you are in a physical classroom so I can push them to get a little bit better grades than they can actually get without that kind of effort. So I can't do that online. I can't do that online. And human communication is mostly body language. I can't see that because when I walk into a classroom, I can read everyone even before I talk to them because 55% of the human communication is basically body language. And, uh, and that 50%, 55% is gone in online teaching. So before this pandemic started, I was thinking like, like, why can't we do this online? And I was always telling my campus and the administration that uh, we should go online. Like, why, why do we have to come to a physical place and conduct lesson? But I was wrong. I was wrong and my experience, we need physical classrooms. We can't replace physical classroom with online uh, teaching environment. But if the student is really motivated, really passionate about the subject, then that'll work. But that's like, I don't know, maybe 10% of the cases. Majority of the people are in an academic classroom because they have to be, not because they want to be. Other than that, like when we take a look at the school and the other universities, the big picture of Sri Lanka, uh, there are some research. <clears throat> Majority of the people got a phone but very few people got a laptop or tablet-like device. Uh, and uh, very few people are spending more than 800 rupees per month for internet connections, which is nowhere near good enough for online teaching learning experience. So uh, approximately 30%, 28% to be exact, people got a laptop and appropriate internet connection for online teaching learning experience. That means 68%. like. Majority of the people, more than 72%, nearly 70% of the people are left out or they can't get the exact same experience, like a proper experience. Uh, so we have a problem. One with the internet, internet connection, the other one with devices. And uh, if we assume that you can use a phone to get a good teaching learning experience, I disagree. I think you should at least have a laptop or a tablet. Phone is not a good device to have that kind of teaching learning experience. If you assume like, okay, you can use a phone, then our numbers are bumping up because everyone got a phone. Uh, but again, the internet connection, because we are paying for the bandwidth, not for the speed. So uh, 
most of the people are spending like 400 rupees. Some of the people are paying 800 rupees, which is okay for uh, just to go to internet and just check that, okay, I went to internet, that's it. But if you're going to do something serious on internet, you should pay at least 2000, maybe nearly 2000 rupees per month to get a proper internet connection to do something serious. So those are the challenges. Those are the challenges. One is the communication. We can't do a proper communication here. And some of the students, they don't want to be here. So they can simply leave. And I don't even know. And uh, the other thing is uh, the way we build internet connection in Sri Lanka. So yeah, that's the picture. And I'm waiting to uh, go to my real classroom really soon. Thank you very much, Mr. Malin. I think uh, uh, yeah. a lot of uh, uh, people watching right now do appreciate your enthusiasm for the physical classroom. I think we all, I think most of us do. Uh, but like you said, you know, it, there's a lot in terms of infrastructure and accessibility that we do need to concern. Thank you, Mr. Malin. And uh, the same question to uh, Ms. Vanessa as well. Uh, yes. Um, well, um, I, in my case, like I work with uh, various age groups, starting from maybe two and a half up to adults, right? And uh, also from various parts in the country. And I totally agree with you, Malinda. Uh, as for online learning, it depends on the learner, right? There are some learners, I'm talking about any age group here. If they're motivated to learn, they find a way. And yes, whatever mode of uh, teaching that is used is effective. But you also get the children who get very distracted because of online learning. There are some who suffer things like eye strain and headaches. There are some who even, um, what do you call, uh, who are not able to actually sit and focus for a lot of time. So if you look at like children in general, like yes, online learning can cater to some kids but not to all. And the other point I must bring up is also the geographical location. Like, yes, in Colombo, sometimes the network is really great. And uh, yeah, kids say have access, has uh, access to devices and, you know, they can find a way. But there are also students like in other parts of the country where internet is pretty scarce, so they may face network issues. So in parts, in uh, other parts of the island, like uh, I heard that even like there's no kind of online learning as such going on, right? Even so there are places where even WhatsApp is not known, right? So in that case, you, it's not that you can reach out to everybody. And yes, I think uh, nothing like the physical classroom, right? Because uh, there's a lot of experience that you could give a child through the physical classroom, there's a lot of hands-on activities that can be done, which may not, where you might not be actually able to do it online, right? So uh, yes, I prefer doing physical sessions <laughs> compared to online, but in this current pandemic, right? With regard to the current situation in the country, it's great that we at least have this mode to keep in touch with students right, even administer therapy and all that online. So, yeah, so that's my answer. Thank you very much, ma'am. I think uh, we got a lot from uh, your special insight of working with a lot of children of different age ranges. And I think uh, it's very true when it comes to children, they do have uh, different ways of learning and uh, the accessibility, once again, the uh, iteration of the same problem, a common problem that we all have. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. And, uh, uh, moving on to Mr. Thar. Uh, well, I'd like to uh, add in uh, to a bit of a different perspective here because uh, now I interact with a lot of uh, students a age of 16 years and above and a lot of adult learners uh, who are professionals in their, uh, in their own capacity. So in terms of uh, the, the buying power or connecting to uh, internet, uh, all that is more or less being covered. And uh, I think for the first time, uh, in the country or in home, rather in uh, in the SEMA advantage, I must say that uh, because in 2015 we went all online exams, we, uh, say May, uh, we managed to convert these online exams so the students could do the exams from home. So 
I mean, see, we gave an opportunity for students to go ahead and take the exams from home, meaning they have a target. They don't have to wait until, you know, we resume or rather get back to the, the, the institutes or to take the exams. So with that in hand, what happened was, uh, say, from March to uh, April uh, this year, quickly, all our tuition partners, they switched to uh, online learning. And uh, the different perspective that I want to touch upon here is now we analyzed uh, the pass rates of students who have followed the face-to-face -face, uh, sessions along with the, the online learning because the same exam, I mean, there's no way that, I mean, we have not changed the, the testing mechanism altogether. It just, the exams are being delivered, you know, from home. I'll touch upon the platform that we're using in a bit. Uh, so the pass rates, uh, I mean, is pretty much the same and in certain cases have gone up. So I don't, I mean, that's, that's an observation that we have noticed uh, from this end of the spectrum. So, uh, so that's also out there. And in terms, I, I completely agree with what Vanessa said in terms of uh, the motivation factors that are in place. You know, you need to, you know, to find out what motivates the students to continue. I mean, obviously, I, I really don't think uh, an online session should go beyond one hour at all. I mean, that's that's my observation. And you need to have those, you know, I mean, see, we used to, we used to sit down in on uh, in a face to face session for about a face to face session for and if you are trying to replicate the same system here in an online mechanism i don't think that works at all so that also needs to be uh, concentrated uh, and considered in terms of the delivery so finally uh, see you need to have a mechanism of testing as well as the delivery should match to that so i think that can make a bit of a difference along to the online learning experience thank you very much mr tarud i think you uh, touched on to us uh, with the expertise that you have uh, from a totally different uh, range of the population that uh, we are talking about right now, the ones, the students who are learning. And I believe that we addressed this question, we looked at this from a very diverse uh, set of fields. And I'd like to go into something that uh, Ms. Vanessa actually mentioned. Uh, when it comes to children, with uh, they have uh, different needs. Actually, uh, this is uh, related to, this can be directed to Ms. Janit as well. Uh, uh, this is- uh, Sandra, actually, if I can, children, if I may interject. Yeah, could I add just one thing for yes, what sir. these guys said? I mean, this is a pure uh, observation of mine. I mean, uh, not that I have kids of my own. I've just seen kids have Zoom classes, right? I think this is something that we've all seen in the in these days. And I think something we need to teach, because I think in our attendee list, there's a lot of parents of younger kids. So I think, I mean, in terms of social etiquette, we, we understand what social etiquette is, right? I mean, if you're, there's a queue, you don't go and jump in front. If someone's talking, you don't interrupt that person, right? I think as, as parents, what we need to teach our kids right now is so like internet and, and social media etiquette, right? In Zoom classes, I see like thousands of kids at about one go scream, teacher, 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 right? And some of them are not muting the uh, mics when the teacher is talking. And some of them are just chatting on the chat box in the corner, right? I think as parents right now, I mean, we have to manage with this, this with this pandemic and, and this current situation and there might be Zoom classes, I don't know, for the next one year, on and off, right? So I think as parents, what we need to teach our kids is online etiquette, where we okay teach them, okay, if the teacher is talking right now, mute your you know microphone. If one kid is asking questions, okay, this is the time you can ask questions. Do not, you know, uh, go and chat with your friends on the chat bar and disturb everyone and having the camera on. I mean, the teacher can always set the rules. Everyone has to have their camera on. Otherwise, you don't know whether the kids are listening. So I think we need to set, uh, this is the new normal, right? So we have to set a few uh, boundaries on what, you know, uh, online etiquette should be. And I think parents and teachers alike should teach their kids what that is. Definitely, Mr. Jani. Thank you very much for adding that. I believe a very... Uh, uh, something very golden that everybody listening in should take to heart, the social etiquette that you should have, even as parents, that you should teach your, uh, as the same way you've been teaching the etiquette of social life, uh, to teach the etiquette of uh, the electronic, like the online life as well to your children. Uh, thank you very much once again, Mr. Janit. And uh, coming back to my uh, question, uh, now when it comes to uh, Mr. Janit, uh, actually uh, we can go with this, uh, all the speakers can definitely contribute to these questions. Uh, so uh, when it comes to children, especially they face a lot of uh, cyber bullying and uh, a lot of you can take in, when it, when it uh, comes to classes even, uh, Zoom and other platforms have the private chat option that allows them to 
engage with other students. It's, it's sort of the same thing that took place in the classroom, evolved onto an online sphere. Uh, so when it comes to children facing depression, etc., cyber bullying in general, uh, also we have, on the other hand, children with special needs who may not get the exact care that they need when it comes to online learning. Uh, so Ms. Vanessa, when it comes to children with special needs and uh, even the, those children and apart from them, the other set of children who are facing depression and other mental health conditions as well, how do you think they should, uh, the parents uh, should uh, help out and how do you think the children can cope up with this as well? At the same time, Mr. Janit and, uh, Mr., uh, and all the other gentlemen as well, uh, how do you think that cyberbullying, the effect of cyberbullying can be curbed because this problem is bigger now than ever? And uh, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, if, uh, Ms. Vanessa could begin. Um, yes. So um, when it comes to children with special needs, this is a challenge that we are facing nowadays because, yes, while there are some who might be able, okay, when I refer to special needs, I'm referring to a huge spectrum starting from things like learning disabilities to children with very severe um, um, conditions, right? So I'm looking at a wide range there, right? So they, while there would be some kids who might be able to sit for 30 minutes or less than that, there are also the children, there are some kids who would not even uh, come near a device, right? So in terms of delivery, like there are some kids that we still cannot access on online learning, right? Uh, so let me just focus a bit on like uh, teaching online to kids with special needs. Okay, one thing is we need to bear in mind that these children have a unique way of learning. They all have their strengths, they have their challenges. So as parents, one of the key areas to work in with your child is to identify what the strength of your child is because that's just a clue as to how to work with them, right? Like, for example, I do see my clients online these days and I know each of them and what is it that they're interested in and what would get their attention, right? So say if the child is a child who likes to draw, likes to always construct things on uh, engaging handwork, I would make sure that my lesson has enough of activities that cater to that need. And that is what helps me keep the child engaged, right? Also bear in mind that yes, these children will find it hard to focus for a long period of time. So sitting through one or two hour session for 30 minutes or 10 minutes, I don't know, it depends on the child, right? And uh, it's no point forcing them at times because the moment you force, that is when you face all kinds of behavioral issues, right? So understand your child, right? Permit regular breaks because they really need that, right? And uh, the other thing is also I must mention that um, again, when it comes to children with special needs or any child for, the matter, for that matter, um, Remember that when you say learning, it's not only limited to content, right? Yes, you might have an online class, teacher might deliver content. But remember that learning goes beyond content, right? So whatever that is taught, it's important that it is practiced, that there are hands-on activities, that there are uh, activities that they could engage in so that they understand the concept in a different way. They gain practical exposure to it, right? So um, I know that these days it's quite a challenge and I have many parents who come up with the same question, what do we do, right? So get involved in your child's learning, right? Always think of ways and activities that you could do that will cater to the interest of the child, that will build their skills, that will help them uh, grasp the lesson. You can even ask teachers or people for suggestions also, right? And the other thing is also maintain a routine at home, right? Just because they are at home and not going to school, there's also a disruption in their normal routine. 
So maintain a routine so that there is some kind of structure for their day. And that also helps them to calm down. They, when they know that, okay, this is what I need to do at this time. It sorts out a lot of problems, right? And uh, last but not least, always remember there are good days, there are bad days with a child with special needs. There are days that are really great. And yes, we work with them. Space, right? So, I yes, uh, thank, thank you, Miss Vanessa. Yeah, now you, you audible, yes, towards the end. Thank you, Miss. Uh, and uh, I'd like to honestly uh, thank you for I mean, being a teacher myself. Uh, it's a challenge that all the teachers face uh, when it comes to teaching. Uh, children, especially during this time, it's after many generations that we, all of us, all of humanity is facing a pandemic. And I believe that uh, we, we all need to adapt. We all need to uh, adapt with the change of COVID-19 and go forward. And I, I also like to, I would like to appreciate what you said about routines. I think all the parents, something you should take into account is have a routine for your children. Uh, even yourself as well, even if you haven't considered one, uh, because we often see that children follow through example and they learn through different forms, different content. Some like to read, some like to watch, some like to get hands-on experience. So uh, learn, identify what your child's need is, how they learn and cater to that. Thank you, Ms. Vanessa. And uh, now, Mr. Janit, uh, with regards to cyberbullying, and uh, I mean, I'm sure the other gentleman can add on to this, uh, the area that we are focusing on as well. Uh, cyberbullying, again, is something that leads to depression, etc., and on and on. So something that children, especially when they're with their technology, they are alone. Most of the time, they are un unsupervised, unaccompanied by a parent or a guardian. Uh, how in this atmosphere, especially uh, uh, in, a, in, an, uh, in a, a time where the global pandemic has caused us to stay in our homes, how do you think cyberbullying curbed in general, Mr. Janet? Yeah, this yeah, sir, can I, add on as well. Yeah, thanks. So I think Vanessa touched upon most of the, the psychological factors of, of all of this, right? I mean, in terms of what I can add, I think in term, I, what I can add is what you can do legally. I think this is uh, something that a lot of parents and, and parents, especially older kids, teens, uh, aren't aware of because most of the time we think that when something is going on online in Sri Lanka, there's not much you can do. But uh, to be honest, currently the, the situation in Sri Lanka is not so. There's a lot you can do. Right? We, we, I mean, since this is a varied audience, I'm not going to go into detail of what these things are. And I'm sure as parents, they know what this is. So when there's any form of cyberbullying, any form of, of, of uh, uh, malpractice online there's uh, one of two ways you can do there's a definite uh, unit at the uh, cyber crimes it's called the cyber crimes unit it's at the trc the telecom regulatory commission of sri lanka and if you go and uh, lodge a complaint in the cyber crimes unit against any of this cyber bullying any of that uh, i've worked with them personally on so many things so they are quite prompt so there's a lot you can do in terms of taking down content that is uh, that it that amounts to malpractice online through this cyber crimes unit that is at the TRC, and secondly we we have the child protection force which I know for a fact does a lot of good work in terms of cyber bullying and and when where children are targeted uh, especially online. So these are the two practical ways that you can uh, redress things that are done online against children in Sri Lanka. So I think uh, it's time we educate ourselves as parents about what you can do because there's no point thinking okay this is a whatsapp message that is being spread there's nothing you can do no there's definitely things you can do this is a facebook uh, 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 post that has been you know uh, put up by a fake profile there's nothing we can do about it no there's a lot you can do so these are the ways you can definitely seek redress in terms of you know what you can do legally within the the context of sri lanka Thank you, Mr. Janit. Uh, I appreciate you for mentioning those two uh, methods that uh, parents can 
uh, legally uh, at the same time uh, with their children in regard of their children act on when it comes to cyber bullying uh, uh, mr malinda and uh, mr tarinda would you like to add on to this as well mr tarinda uh, yeah uh, uh, about cyber bullying uh, uh, Sandro, uh, the thing is uh, like let's say uh, now that uh, before before the internet we had the real life right we did not have any kind of virtual life so in actual life we are getting bullied we cannot really do anything like let's say someone is going to punch me in the face uh, i can't block him right so i can't report him but uh, as janit said now that uh, in the internet every like all of those accounts are visible let's say someone's bullying me or someone's creating uh, false content about me and destroying my personality destroy my image or anything so in that case there's a lot we can do but the thing is like lots of people don't know what to do. So uh, if we can bridge that gap, things can be solved way easier than in real life. Because in a school, like let's say I'm a kid and I'm in school and other kids are bullying me and uh, physically, like let's say not just verbally, physically, things are not that visible, right? Like I have to speak to someone else, say that, okay, these people are punching me in face and uh, these people lock me in a locker room or something like that. So, uh, but on the internet, all of these things are visible. So we can see all the content on our timelines. So we can report those uh, creators and we can uh, take all the legal actions and stuff. The thing is, uh, we should know that there's such a law and we should know uh, what are the places to go to. We have CERT and as Janet said, we have separate uh, department in a TRC. So people should know about those things because they are like internet police. Like when something goes wrong, we go to police, right? So they are like internet police, like we should know that there's such a thing exist. Then lots of things could be solved. Thank you, Mr. Mavid. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, as far as uh, uh, the, the cyberbullying and what could be done and what things that the, as parents that needs to be educated, I think that the speakers have covered it. Uh, 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 I, the only thing that I would want to add here is uh, now the educational platforms that we are using right now and uh, there are certain restrictions that are in place i mean i mean simple things like you know not being able to chat with each other while the session is going on there are there are certain options that are in place so as parents who are listening in if you are quite worried about you know your student being distracted there are uh, there are options in place as as, as long as uh, the, the the teacher or the lecturer is aware of it and use the right platform and the right resource to do that so just want to add on that Definitely. Thank you very much, Mr. Tarindu, and all the panelists for adding on to that. Uh, and uh, now I'd like to focus on something entirely different. While, but also, do I would like to also add in something that when it comes to uh, now, most of the attendees might be thinking, yes, uh, the Sri. If you go to a, uh, a uh, if you go to a normal police station in Sri Lanka and say I want to complain about my online uh, Facebook or something or uh, this of the sort, it would be it would uh, cause to a laughing stock. Uh, but see, the thing is, uh, like Mr. Janit mentioned, there are certain agencies, even though you may not know, now you are aware. Uh, there are places you can reach out to, there are people you can speak to. Uh, this is actually happening. Uh, parents, if you are listening in, and children, if you are listening in, and if you think that you are facing this as well, there are places you can go to, and there are people that you can talk to. Uh, at the same time, I'd like to focus my question to uh, Mr. Uh, Malinda and Mr. Tarindu now. Uh, when it comes to uh, the education institutions, in Sri Lanka. Uh, now, now we see with, like I mentioned earlier as well, and like you all did as well, the education institutes in Sri Lanka have been, have caused to have, uh, in a way, forced themselves to go online. But uh, majority of the panel, I believe, uh, showed a negative response to the online learning. But at the same time, uh, I, I understand that totally. I mean, I'm sure everybody does. Uh, but at the same time, where do you see educational institutes in general going on in the next five, 10 years? Will we be because uh, working uh, from home and learning from home as well has formed to be easier despite its uh, negative aspects as well so do you think this will continue do you think it will not what are the new trends we are expecting and what should the children and the parents uh, expect when it comes to educational institutes high education uh, education in general uh, when it comes to uh, the education institutions what do you think we can expect the other panelists can also add in Right, uh, I may start. So, uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, uh, when someone said uh, uh, that the uh, teaching learning experience is not only about content, if it was only about content, uh, 
we could have take everything online, no problem. But uh, it's a social experience. So when we are in a classroom, when we are in a university, uh, the studies, academics is playing a really small role, by the way. Like it's a social experience. We are learning how to live, like navigate through different social like activities. So uh, those things, I don't really think like we don't have, like we don't have such a technology to take such a thing online yet, but we can take some of those things online. Let's say uh, I am conducting a tutorial class and I'm conducting uh, in the tutorial class, I'm doing a tutorial and a case study. I do that in class, but uh, the lecture, I can take it online easily, right? So we can uh, reduce the uh, resource consumed in physical and infrastructure in the university by taking some parts online. But I don't really think that we can take everything online. So uh, that's exactly what we tried in NCHS. We tried 50% uh, online and 50% in-class sessions. So in the in-class session, we are doing case studies, the problem solving sessions, the brainstorming sessions. Those things are we are doing in class. And uh, the content delivery, the lecture slides and that kind of stuff we did online. We can do that. But uh, if you're thinking beyond the current technology, uh, if we can uh, integrate something like augmented reality and virtual reality, and then I think uh, I think uh, like that that's going to be magical. By the way, like let's say I'm here, and even now I am. We are doing a very weird social interaction, right? I can see these boxes, and in these boxes I can see you. Like this is not how real life is working. But if we can, if I can wear VR goggle. And I can see Janit Venis and Tarindu and Sandro in front of me, like your avatars, maybe that would be awesome. So, uh, but we don't really have smooth technology to do that kind of stuff yet. So, if we have that kind of stuff, if we can create a virtual classroom, then things would be better, right? Things would be better. But uh, I don't really think the technology will be ready in the next few years. Uh, it'll take like at least five years to get the technology up to that level. And the internet connection uh, should improve lots of things other than the bandwidth and the speed and stuff, the ping. You know what, you know, if you know what I mean, uh, like the latency of the internet connection should be improved. So uh, if we can get all of those things done, we can take maybe half of the uh, teaching learning experience online, especially the content delivery. And then we can go to the actual physical facility. We can use the physical infrastructure to do the problem solving session and that kind of stuff. I think that's where we are heading anyways. Like we have to innovate because there's no other option uh, for the next two years, I guess. Uh, but uh, I think we can continue that paradigm even, even uh, after the pandemic situation. Like now that I'm convinced that we can do the content delivery online, we can do the practical sessions in university. We might be able to continue that even after the pandemic situation. Thank you, Mr. Yes, Mr. Yes, I, I completely agree with uh, Malinda. Uh, as far as we are concerned as a country, are we ready for the next five to 10 years? Where are we heading with this? So, and also I believe this dials down to, uh, you know, managing time. I mean, are we as students or adult learners, do we manage our time properly? I mean. We have enough examples of how uh, is it that we save time and reinvest this in other activities like through the online mechanisms that we have in place, uh, following other uh, uh, programs simultaneously, which you did not have the opportunity, uh, say a couple of months ago. If you if you look into uh, these uh, say micro credentials that are out there that are coming in, and uh, so work while study, as you correctly mentioned, so. Uh, I mean, I believe this should reflect in the new forms of timetables that Malinda was just describing and short hours of face-to-face uh, -face sessions and, uh, you know, more focus on research-based learning. I mean, gone are the days that we can count on a teaching mechanism that is over two centuries old, but we need to get there as fast as possible. I mean, uh, I must quote uh, Professor Sampat Amartunga, the chairman of UGC, who was there at one of our sessions uh, Yesterday, he said uh, online learning is the way for and being, you know, heading all the state sector universities, universities in the country. And you need to get on board with this or simply step aside his words. So we might not require big buildings. I'm, I'm just quoting, uh, I mean, I'm just referring to the fact that we might not require big buildings moving forward, unless otherwise you need to have students together for networking opportunities and connect with each other, which is very essential. I mean, I mean, uh, and uh, certainly not long hours to be seated where what we used to a couple of years ago. And uh, uh, so we need to strike that balance between both face-to-face -face and online learning, the blended learning that Malinda is looking at right now and being physically present uh, uh, for studies, be it SEMA or university or, uh, you know, not, it's only to learn, you know, 
but also to build connections. So unless otherwise you have that physical interaction with uh, the colleagues that you have, I mean, how many uh, connections that you have, your, your friends that you know of, you know, who you have known through the classes. Of course, we have the WhatsApps, uh, we have uh, the LinkedIn's and you can connect with them, but you know, that, that the physical interaction dials down to that uh, last bit and say, look, you understand the person, you understand the behavior of the person and you will tend to connect with them. So finally, yes, uh, you need to strike that balance between physical uh, presence as well as online presence in terms of learning. Uh, five to ten years down the line, I think. Uh, I mean, we are we are almost we are already there. We are getting there. We, we are not there yet. So five to ten years down the line, I think we should be able to not necessarily convert one hundred percent online, but to maintain this balance between uh, the blended learning opportunities. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tarindu. And would the other uh, uh, panelists like to uh, add on? This sentiments. Uh, moving on, I, I would actually like to come in into this uh, very uh, strong uh, uh, because, uh, and I love how uh, both of them uh, emphasize on a. Uh, on a sort of hybrid uh, scheme that we may be looking in as the uh, time comes in when it comes to education institutes. Thank you very much once again, Mr. Malid and Mr. Tarindu. Uh, and uh, moving on, I have a question to Mr. Janit. Uh, Mr. Janit, now, when it comes to uh, the television shows and especially coming from a, a famous media organization yourself, uh, television shows and uh, television content in general, we see uh, parents and we see children uh, watching these uh, shows with their parents. Are, uh, in general, of course, uh, are age-appropriate content, is age-appropriate content, my apologies, uh, being circulated in the general media? And if it is not, how do we protect our children, uh, the uh, younger generations, from consuming content they do not need at certain ages? Because we see a lot of uh, trends, especially Ms. Vanessa would agree, Ms. Malinda would agree, Ms. Tarindu uh, Tarind would also agree, when it comes to schools in general, you see a lot of trends they pick up from television and uh, some unhealthy, some definitely healthy. Uh, in general, Mr. Jani, what do you think uh, the uh, media sector in general uh, can do for this? And what can the parents also do with regards to this uh, media? Yeah, Sandra. To be honest, the thing is, uh, if you're talking about terrestrial televisions and, and, and radio stations in Sri Lanka, I don't think any of them broadcast anything that is age inappropriate, because as you know, we have a very stringent system of licensing and all that. So I think that in itself makes uh, terrestrial television easy. I think where we need to be careful, like you said, is online and, and what kids consume online. And that also without the guidance of an adult. So if there's the guidance of an adult, there's obviously, you know, uh, scrutiny on, on what your kids should be watching. And also, again, I, I understand that's a spectrum, right? I mean, Vanessa would agree that, that the sensitivities of, of what one parent thinks is appropriate for their kids is, is wildly different from another parent's. So for me, I think in terms of digital, the, 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 what you need to follow as a parent is quite simple. If you're going to watch a movie or, or give a kid a movie without your, you being physically present there, I think that the, the most easiest, uh, resource you have, which I, I generally look at is Common Sense Media. It's a website called commonsensemedia.org. It's a website essentially run by parents. Any movie that is out, any TV show that is out, parents give it a rating and, and, and suggest what is the best age uh, a kid needs to be to watch this content. And it has a lovely breakdown of, you know, what kind of content it is, whether it's sensitive, whether it's you know, whether there are slurs, whether there's uh, explicit language, all of that is clearly set out. So anyone needs to, you know, just give a kid a video or, or a movie to watch and you're not sure whether this is, because sometimes the ratings on the movie does not reflect exactly what the movie is. So commonsensemedia.org is the easy resource you can go to and find out okay, is this actually appropriate for my kids. And in terms of Netflix, I think with this pandemic, what we're seeing is mostly we give our kids Netflix or we give our kids YouTube. Okay? Uh, I would say don't because one, the content that is uh, in both those platforms in the unguided version is is quite varied. Right? So both those platforms have a kid-friendly version, Netflix Kids and YouTube Kids. 
those are the apps you should give. And I think every phone, every device, including iPads, have guided access to make sure, okay, when you give the kid, YouTube kids, they do not open any other apps on that device, right? So I think parents need to be a little tech savvy. And these are very simple things. It's not rocket science. You just give them YouTube kids or Netflix kids, or you're physically present. And if you, before giving them content, you just do a little research, like on the resources that I told you, okay, is this appropriate for my kid? And, and the values I want to imbibe in my kid, does this movie and this content match it? Then it's fine. So it's a very simple formula as a parent, what you need to do. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Janit. And I'd also like to tell the audience that we are open for questions. If you do have any questions, you can put them on the comment section if you are watching on Facebook. Uh, we would really appreciate the panel, would really appreciate. We'll have a questions and answer session Q&A towards the end. Uh, and we are coming towards the end, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So I'd like to ask uh, uh, the panelists actually some a very different question. Uh, but before we get into that, uh, I have a small question, Ms. Vanessa, uh, uh, with regards to what Ms. Janit and everybody was mentioning, actually, uh, when it comes to internet uh, addiction, we know that there is a disorder uh, uh, associated with that as well, and uh, it, uh, how children show the symptoms with regards to Now, we had the recent uh, uh, PlayStation 5 out a few days ago, and uh, we see uh, in that itself, we see a lot of children being obsessed with us and young children, especially when you take these uh, play uh, their games out of them, out of their reach, they start showing aggressive symptoms. Uh, so children in general, Ms. Vanessa, not only uh, gaming, actually uh, gaming, uh, which is, will be my next uh, open question to the panelists. Uh, before that, uh, the in general, not only gaming, when it comes to anything that children get uh, addicted to on internet, on online, anything in general, is what do you think uh, the, uh, the parents can do to cope with this? And the children also, what can the parents, especially because the teachers, the parents, the support system of the child, what, the, what can they teach uh, the children and how can we take a softer approach in uh, returning to our kids? Yes, um, I must uh, mention that, yes, you do see aggression, but remember that aggression is just a symptom and there is a root cause. So just like any behavior any human being has, there's always a root cause behind it. So what we just see is, okay, then or the moment you take the device, they get aggressive, right? But the question is, why does that happen, right? And if we actually dig deeper into it, right, most of the time, there are certain causes for addictions, even in, I mean, addictions in general as per se, right? So uh, sometimes, yes, we know that excessive screen time, right? It has an effect on the brain. And yes, just like any other addiction, it's a very similar pattern that we see, right? But the question is, okay, what made the child actually get addicted? And many a times when we look into the history of the problem, we notice that sometimes there are kids who feel lonely, right? Because they don't have, they have no other means right to interact or to nothing else to do right as well as there are some children who suffer from depression and anxiety and yes when you go on social media take your screen out right yes you can just divert all those thoughts and it's more like a distraction right and there are some children who actually use it as a way to cope with stress so when you look at it that way yes they're using screen time just to minimize the distress that they are actually facing, right? So now the, what we see as aggression has a root, right? So as parents, I have just a few recommendations, a few points that you could uh, maybe I could share with you so that uh, it will help you with your kids, right? So um, I know the common thing is the parent would try to take the device away, okay, he's addicted to it, best is I take it and throw, okay, keep it away. But that is not a solution, right? The child would get more aggressive. If you take it away, you need to give him another option, right? You have to see, okay, what is it that my child likes doing? What is it that could keep him engaged? And you need to give him another option at that point, not just take it away and just let the child fend for himself, right? So um, one of the ways is to encourage other interests and other social activities, right? 
So there would be things that you could get together and do as a family, right? That could also help spending time with the family. Sometimes even just playing even a board game, right? I mean, it helps a family spend quality time, right? As well as, yes, you need to have a routine for your child, right? So most of the time children get addicted and all that. Sometimes even when there's no proper routine, there's enough of time for their mind to wind away and they don't know what's happening next. They don't know what is expected. So why not just take my device and play a game or do something? But if they have a structure for their day, they know what to expect and there's purpose in their day, right? Also, another thing I find is, yes, Usually when kids are aggressive, they're punished, right? Now, of course, very common, sometimes you give them a time out. I'm not saying that uh, behavior should not have consequences. Yes, you need to have clear rules and consequences. But at the same time, after the child calms down, it's important that you discuss it with the child and teach this child the skills he needs to address his aggression. Like for example, I could say, okay, the child got angry, but some, and maybe he threw everything, threw his toys around or dashed the device on the ground. It can, right? But the reason is sometimes when the child gets angry, the child actually doesn't know, okay, I'm angry and this is how I should react. He thinks that is the best way and teach them, okay, I know it's hard. I know. You do get angry and we all get angry as human beings, right? But when angry, this is good. So if it's a little child, we sometimes tell them, okay, clench your fist, count to five, or count backwards. Simple strategies like that, right? And each time they get angry, sometimes we say, okay, what could you do at a time like this, right? And they use it to calm themselves down, right? Of course, this is not something that works overnight. It takes practice, it takes time right but these are little things that you can implement right now and um, and at the same time i must mention that yes when your child uh, gets aggressive it's natural for the parents stress level also to skyrocket right i mean it's not easy having a child who's yelling and you know throwing things and all that so make sure before you address the problem that your stress levels are in check so you have to manage your stress levels, right? You have to be very calm, especially when I tackle children with severe behavioral problems, I have to make sure that I'm very calm, right? Because we never correct children in anger, right? We correct them because we want them to change their behavior, right? And uh, also if, if it's like very, if you feel that it's beyond your, um, ability to cope, if it's like getting really out of hand, it's also important to know that you can seek professional help, right? And there are times when, yes, you need to seek professional help. You could go meet a psychologist, right? A person who, uh, who specializes in working with addictions or who has experience working with children with addictions and get the necessary help that you need. Thank you, Ms. Vanessa. I like to uh, honestly admire your efforts and your words of inspiration there for all the parents because uh, it's something that we all need to understand. I like how you emphasized on finding the root cause. I think something that all parents, all everybody watching right now, you, it may be even your friend at school if you are a student, uh, always find the root cause. Your friend or your child is always acting out because of a reason. and. Uh, also, I'd like to focus on something that Ms. Vanessa mentioned, that is uh, seeing uh, these addictions as a form of escapism. Uh, that makes me come into uh, another topic that I, I'm, uh, Mr. I actually need to mention Mr. Ravi Mijetilaka, the CEO of Gamer.lk, who was supposed to join us. He unfortunately could not. Uh, but I still like to, I believe uh, it is a very pertinent thing. I'm sure many of the parents watching uh, would like this discussed as well. So a little uh, perspective perhaps from the speakers to your uh, maximum, that is. Uh, I'd like to actually direct this to Mr. Janit, if it's all right, um, uh, when it comes to gaming, actually. Uh, but everybody in general can add on. 
so a lot of people have uh, this uh, a negative stereotype when it comes to gaming now but on a very personal note i myself resort to gaming be it online or uh, even in the field to distract myself to go into escapism i'm sure everybody because the whole panel i'm sure like miss vanessa said you know play a board game these are the things we grew up with that's how our minds are um, uh, minds are our minds infrastructure is prepared to uh prepared with so why our intelligent has involved uh, evolved apologies right the hand eye coordination so uh, when it comes to this gaming does play a very important role when it comes to analytical skills of uh, kids if you uh, if i'm not mistaken some reports do compare children with who have gamed who have uh, engaged themselves in online gaming to be uh, more uh, intelligent as well so uh, with uh, all of these in general what are your thoughts uh, panel when it comes to mr janit uh, initially uh when it comes to online gaming are there perks what are the perks that the parents watching right now should know uh, but at the same time what are the limits what are the deterrents and in your personal perspective that is we are a bit uh, because with the absence of mr ravin i like this however to be uh, brought into light something that parents must be going through these days definitely mr janit yeah thanks and i was also hoping ravin will be here uh, but i'm sure i will have a friendly face in malinda because i know he games and tari do hopefully uh so honestly see gaming technology we have to view all of these things as tools right uh, a knife in the hands of a thief is dangerous the knife in the hands of a doctor is great right i'm um, for me i i i can't talk about the psychology of it right because i also game and i don't know if there's something wrong with me but uh, in terms of the industry i think something that parents should know is that the gaming industry is fast overtaking even the movie industry some of the big budget games of the world right uh, have budgets that are bigger than some of the biggest movies that you can think of right so and there is in terms of technology i think malinda can speak a little bit more on this uh, i i see a convergence of movies and gaming in future i think movies will have some sort of choice mechanism some sort of playability factor i think technology is moving there i'm hoping it will it, it has in certain ways so and and recently i can give you another personal example because uh, we started a new uh, animation and gaming studio in here in sri lanka and when i was looking for talent i was so surprised that it's so hard to find because i couldn't find the right animators uh, i couldn't find the right uh, qa guys to do my testing i mean i know a lot of kids play gaming here games but then unfortunately we don't view that as a profession anymore but uh in 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 foreign countries especially in the US and Canada gaming is a big big source of revenue for those countries and and for me i think it's going to be a very big industry but in terms of sri lanka we are really lagging behind and that's unfortunate because i i don't think we lack talent it's just we have demonized gaming to a point that uh, most people don't look at it as a profession right and even animation and 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 so forth so my my personal insight here is that uh there are opportunities and if if some kids have that affinity to gaming i'm not saying you know uh, stop everything and let them game uh, 9 to 5 but there there could be some merit in in those things as because i mean see gaming how the same game engine that's used to make games is the same game engine it's called unity it's the same thing that my teams are currently using to make animation right so creating those environments these are all gamers who have understood what gaming is and they are creating animations right now for us it's going to be one of sri lanka's bigger animation productions which will be coming out probably next uh, mid or late next year right so i'm um, this is just my industry insight that you know it should not be demonized it's definitely a technology and in the hands of the the right kid with the right parent who gives the right direction you know uh, has uh, plausible boundaries where there is uh, no negative effects of that technology it's just technology right we have to view it as a tool so that's my insight i mean gaming for me personally i, I don't think it should be demonized and uh, i think as an industry it's something especially a small country like sri lanka can definitely harness if we you know uh, inculcate the right talent i think i'm hoping marinda can add after me definitely uh, mr marinda right yes uh, janit said that uh, like we have this uh, possibility to turn a game into a movie and movie into a game and that convergence is actually happening because when you take a look at lots of modern games they are so realistic then when you are playing it you feel like it's a movie and the rendering details lighting shadows everything looks so realistic and uh, i remember when i was playing assassin creed like 
way back, the graphic was not that realistic, but uh, still I was living inside the game. Then the Grand Theft Auto, San Andreas, back in the days, now that we have updated version. So when I was playing those games, I was living in that environment. So uh, that's pretty great. And the computer games, especially uh, the FPS game, the first person shooter games, is giving us this opportunity to process lots of visual information and auditory information in such a short time and take a really good decision. And we cannot really practice that anywhere else. So it's triggering a specific neuron circuit in our brain. And uh, that's really good training for your brain, for your memory, for your quick decision making, processing lots of information. At the same time, those games are designed in such a way. Uh, we call those things uh, dopamine driven feedback loop, if I'm not wrong. Those are dopamine driven feedback loops. That means once we do it, once we achieve something, we want to do it again. Then we won't do it again, again, and again. Then we get addicted. So those things are designed in such a way uh, to keep uh, keep us engaged in the game. So that is the problem with the uh, computer games. So then we get addicted. So the best way to solve that problem. So let's say when you're playing computer games, your bla your brain is developing in like amazing way. Then you had to use that brain development. You had to invest that brain development somewhere else, right? Otherwise, no point. So. Uh, then you have to have time blocks, easy peasy, right? Let's say allocate one hour uh, every day, maybe two hours, three hours, depending on your time schedule to play computer games. And uh, then uh, there's this technique that the gamers should use. Like if you are like so into game, we call that the dopamine detox, right? So I'm not really, really agreeing with that word, but that's the, the idea is like for a whole day, you're not playing any computer games at all. Right, so then uh, you can stay away from the computer game addiction and get the brain benefits of computer games at the same time, the time blocks and detox. So you play computer games six days, one hour every day, no more than that. You should have discipline. Then for whole day, you're not playing any computer games at all. So then you can have that. And uh, Janet said that the computer game development, the game development uh, and uh, the game development is very complex art because you should have the technology knowledge at the same time, you should be artistic and creative at the same time. Uh, the talent is a problem, yes. Uh, we have good developers, we have good artists, but game developer is a good developer and a good artist at the same time. Uh, and that skill is really rare in Sri Lanka. So if you are into game development, go ahead, study game development, uh, and there are tons of opportunities. Maybe not in Sri Lanka, not yet in Sri Lanka, but since Janet, you are starting this studio. Lots of people, lots of other people will start that kind of game development studio. So the opportunities will be there in Sri Lanka, but all around the planet, there are tons of opportunities. And let's say you're not into game development, you are into computer games, like playing computer games. We call you an esports athlete, right? So uh, next time you can compete in Olympic, maybe, right? As an esport athlete, playing Dota and that kind of different computer games, and maybe win a Olympic gold medal for Sri Lanka. So if there's a tendency for some pe some person, like if you're really good at computer games, go ahead and play computer games. Like if you're really good at playing computer games, like let's say you are really good at playing cricket. So we are always inspiring you. Go ahead and play cricket, join the national team, go to the next World Cup, we inspire you, right? So if you are really good at computer games, I inspire you. Uh, Play computer games, practice, join teams, and compete in international competition, and maybe try to give it a try to join Olympic Games and win us a gold medal, right? So that's one pathway. So you can develop games, or you can play games professionally. When you're developing games, you can develop games, and you always you can use a, like go down the path of quality assurance by playing computer games, figuring out different problems. So those opportunities are there. But the biggest problem is computer games are so addictive. So you have to use time blocks and detox. Then you can stay away from the addiction and uh, get the brain benefits of the computer games. It's really good if you're, if you're not playing computer games, play computer games, but don't be addicted. Soda is addictive. All these sugary soda drinks. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. <laughs> All these sugary soda drinks are also addictive, just say. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely, Mr. Janit. I mean, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Malinda and uh, all of you. Yes, Mr. Malinda, would you like to add anything? No, I'm good. Okay, all right. So, uh, 
Uh, I'd like to actually focus on something that uh, the two panelists said before uh, giving the floor to the other panelists to add on. Singling my kiyak tiye na pihe king beli kapan nat puluang beli gidiye kapan nat puluang. Maida ne I think Janit actually mentioned that uh, in the best terms uh, when it comes to gaming as well. I think all the parents something you should definitely understand is that. And at the same time, Mr. Malinda, for all the uh, students listening in, uh, he addressed uh, these games. Uh, the realms that we were especially i myself have played these as well assassin's creed etc and how these games took us to a different world and at the same time how we uh, were in tune with uh, getting in receptors and how our minds were trained as well especially a lot of children going on as well at the same time developers as well i think the assassin's creed would be a universal example in the world where a game that was with creativity with history because a lot of uh, mr valinda you will not uh, i mean you may uh, believe and the parents might not believe that uh, there are people children who know more about history not from their textbooks but through games to the renaissance the uh, us history of all of the world and this is through games so there's a bigger perspective bigger perspective going on in the world right now something that parents should be aware thank you mr malinda and mr janit for making us aware of this uh, mr tarindu and mr vanessa would you like to add on as well any thoughts um yes i think it's also what it shows us is okay what is it that we are using it for right like yes there are good things there are benefits things that we could take and also what i want to add on is that games can also be a, a i mean a good way for parents to connect with their child right so a game would be quite harmful if the child is just you know given the game just so that the parent can get their work done right that is where the problem lies but if the parent joins in plays with the child right there is this interaction there is this relationship this bonding also that takes for, takes place along with playing the game right so that is something that i just want to add on to what the other panelists said definitely uh, that is yeah. start right <laughs> and uh, i i agree with uh, what uh, uh, venessa said in terms of being able to connect with uh, maybe your nieces uh, and, and nephews who pl who plays the game you know you just walk into the game this room and say look what you're doing i'm i'm doing this so can i can i can i get a hang of it so uh, and and also parents were, were quite worried about this uh, i don't know how well this is applicable but uh, uh, there are also like uh, these gaming platforms that are catered to uh, how do i say uh, develop like, developing brain activities like i don't know if you heard of a platform called elevate and all that there are a lot of advertisements that are going on uh, you know simple games that that uh, that uh, you know helps uh, the user to to develop uh, brain activity so i mean there are certain other activities that also can be looked into as far as games are concerned not only uh, uh, the the first person shooter or strategy games that we're looking at so you need to be exposed to them as well thank you very much uh, mr taridu and i appreciate all the uh, input that the speakers gave very insightful uh, very inspirational and i hope uh, sets an example the do example that the parents need when it comes to understanding uh, this uh, uh, very imperative aspect of uh, the children's lives so thank you very much panelists and now let's move on to the questions and answers session we do have a few questions uh, firstly i'd like to take in uh, the question by uh, mr jayanta surya bandara and uh, how uh, he asks uh, how a outstation student uh, can complain on cyberbullying since all these places are mentioned to report um, mentioned to report or locate in colombo can they go to an area of police i think what uh, mr jayant is asking the parent uh, he is asking is uh, the students or children who are in outstation areas how can they report uh, cyberbullying Uh, like uh, i mentioned earlier as well if they go to the police will they be treated as laughing stock and do these organizations i think mr janit mentioned earlier have branches uh, can they go to the area police uh, mr janit's question that is uh, interpreted thanks uh, a bit yeah that's a good question i'm sorry i didn't address that in the beginning i mean thank thankfully due to this pandemic not thankfully uh, we are more worst even these government agencies are more worst at doing things online so both the i mean uh, mahin the mentioned cert i mentioned the cyber crimes unit uh, both of them take uh, complaints through email now 
and and they follow up the process so there's absolutely no problem with proximity so you can still make the call make the complaint and there'll be an email that they that you need to fill up and send and they will update you on the proceedings through through email and and through digital means so there's absolutely no problem with proximity so definitely the only thing that matters is take action that's all i wanted to say because there are these organizations and if there's something happening online to your kid take action so those these things that we mentioned all the organizations do uh, function online thank you mr janit the, the other panelists would you like to add on uh yeah uh, because uh, as janit said uh, both of those organization they have their hotlines just give them a call and some cases when you give them a call they might ask you to go to the nearest police station and lodge a complaint so just follow their instruction first call them or email them uh then follow the instruction uh, through the standard process so it's not a huge deal so but uh, before that like as you said uh when you face this kind of a uh, cyber crime some kind of cyber crime first talk to the relevant department cert or the cyber crime department then follow the instruction don't go to police straight away you might be uh, yeah you will face difficulties so first talk to them then go to police thank you mr malindan the others would you like to add on all right um that being said we have another question coming from uh, miss nilmini uh, my children uh, get severe headaches when they uh, are into online learning is there a remedy please they have online uh, sessions on average of 5 hours she adds more context to this question by telling us uh, to consider that uh, sadly Uh, during the breaks the, the the children go back to their social media and games uh, thus the total online time increases and also the majority of these students uh, live in town areas with limited spaces uh, such as flats uh, what are your thoughts on that uh, panel should i repeat the question and miss nilmini asks uh, my children get severe headaches when they are into online learning and is there a remedy for this because a lot of their online learning time is spent on this uh, i believe uh, miss vanessa perhaps could add on and the others could lead follow yes um, actually this is something that is uh, i mean something to be quite concerned about because um, this is something that i have been hearing from a lot of children and teenagers that they experience headache and a lot of eye strain right so what i would suggest is yes um, you know have regular breaks right but make sure that the break is away from the screen because yes if they go back to social media it's not going to take the headache away because again they are uh, what you call subjecting themselves to more eye strain right so the break there has to be something that they could do during Thank their you very Yes, sorry, Miss. You can go ahead. That okay. was a small lag. Okay, yes. sorry. Yeah, is it clear right now? Is yeah. Is it clear? Right. Yeah. Right. So, um, only thing is like, um, I don't know how long the schools uh, give breaks between sessions, but uh, maybe I'm guessing about ten to fifteen minutes. But make sure that you have some activity or something that they could engage in without turning to their devices. because definitely you have getting a headache or having like a bit of uh, okay sometimes kids say okay you have to rub my eyes my eyes are dry things like that right so that means you need a break from your screen right so always have something some kind of activity that they could engage in during their break time thank you miss uh, would the other panelists like to add on to this yeah i mean i think malinda also can add something to this just from a very technological point of view not all screens are uh, made alike right so it could be i mean we are not doctors here so it could be because sometimes uh, when my teams are on shifts especially when it comes to animation and all that they have to focus on screens for a long time and the screens that we invest on are, are on a different level and and we are very careful with our color correction and especially with nighttime stuff we always use blue light filters 
So there might be something technologically you can do. I mean, Vanessa said the most obvious answer here, right? So there needs to there there need to be breaks. There they need to focus on something beyond. But then in terms of device preference, there are also could be something that you could do in terms of what screen your kid is looking at, because generally desktop monitors are built for longer time use. So I think Malinda also can add something because I know Malinda is very specific on his colors and all of that. So I think there's something that you can do probably to reduce the eye strain from a technological point of view. Right, uh, yes, uh, yes, Janet, uh, because uh, one thing, uh, like uh, you have to pay attention to few things, like if you are getting that kind of headaches and eye strain, when you're looking at a computer screen, maybe you have something wrong with your eyes, but maybe you should meet a doctor. Maybe it's a psychological thing, like I don't want to be here. If I want to, don't want to be here, but at the same time I have to be here, then uh, my mind sometimes react to that as a headache, right? So you have to look into that kind of stuff first. Oh, then uh, you have to take a look at the screen because uh, as Janet said, we have blue light screen, blue light filtering for the nighttime and you have some uh, glasses that you can use. And uh, if your screen uh, is not properly displaying all the colors, because when it comes to my life, I don't really have any kind of choice. I, have, I am looking at a computer screen every day, at least 10 hours and doing various complex stuff. So uh, you have to invest in a good computer monitor with proper colors, uh, then uh, it feels like you are looking at a piece of paper. So then you are not really getting much of eye strain. But in my laptop screen, this one, if I have to look at this computer screen for like two, three hours, then I might get some eye strain. But if I go to my office, there's a proper monitor that as Janet mentioned, like we have proper monitors uh, suitable for extended period of extended period of usage. So maybe you have to invest on that kind of stuff. But before that, I think like you should look at your eyesight and the psychological reason, maybe the actual problem is really there. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Malinda. And uh, would the other panelists like to add on? I don't think I can add much uh, as, as uh, Vanessa Malinda or Janit said. But uh, just an observation from uh, my because this is something that I used to do when I was uh, going through my studies. So uh, some of the sessions uh, say, I mean, if at all, I mean, you could have this conversation with the lecturers or the teachers as well. But some of the sessions are not necessarily need to be taught, uh, I mean, with the video. I mean, you can have an audio clip prepared. Uh, and there are certain podcasts that you could do for certain sessions. So if at all, if there is a possibility of working on those angles of it, I think... Uh, and what I used to do is while I was driving or while I'm, I'm, I'm taking a short break, I just, you know, plug my uh, headset in and I just listen to it. So I just close my eyes and listen to it. So, you know, that kind of work uh, in certain cases. So I think parents also could look into that and maybe have conversations with uh, the lecturers and teachers and maybe look into opportunities of that nature. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Vanessa, would you like to add on? Or we can and go on to the next question as well. All right. Yes, miss. Yes, go ahead. No, no, I was saying you could proceed. That's what I was All about. Right. You could proceed. Apologies. All right. Uh, I have another question from the audience. Actually, there are three questions. I will combine them and uh, make it so that all the panelists could answer. We are moving into the final two questions. Uh, uh, Mr. Hasita asks uh, via Facebook, as far as games concerned, there are so many categories of games, puzzle games, adventure games, and these different types of games uh, impact the child's mind in different ways. At the same time, uh, another person is asking what games are suitable to seven to nine year olds? And also another parent asks what games are suitable for brain development activities? So we have a wide range of questions on gaming uh, uh, once again, uh, we do uh, regret the absence of uh, Mr. Ravi, but at the same time, I would ask, I would like to pose these questions when it comes to the impact of the mind uh, of the games and how the child's mind is affected. Perhaps Ms. Vanessa could add on. And also when it comes to the different types of games that seven to eight year olds uh, can use or even brain development in general, maybe the rest of the panel can put uh, in their little input as well. Panelists? Yes. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, it's all about, okay, what am I going to use this for? Right. So as uh, personally for me, it's not about only, okay, which games develop the brain, which games don't, it's not that. 
um, if I say I'm with, having a session with a child, right? And supposing there's a game that can give deliver the skills that I want the child to gain, right? Say, for example, maybe even a history lesson, like Mr. Malinda said earlier, you know, they, gain, they learn a lot of the terms and all that way faster through the game than they would learn through the book, right? So then at that point, I could make use of a game as a part of my lesson, right? So it's only going to supplement the lesson. I'm using it as a tool to help the child engage in the content that I want uh, him to gain. So uh, that is what personally for me, like any game at all, I would try to see, okay, how can I make use of it for something beneficial? Thank you, uh, Mr. Vanessa. And I believe uh, Mr. Malinda can definitely relate to uh, how students learn with a lot with uh, games, actually history, uh, special emphasis on Assassin's Creed and games such those. How would you say, Mr. Malinda? That's right. But uh, we are talking about a very specific age group that's seven to nine. And I don't really recommend a FPS game for uh, seven to nine people and uh, probably strategy games, some strategy games, but you have to filter those things very carefully and the puzzles and uh, there are different uh, brain development games, like mainly puzzle, puzzles and that kind of stuff, uh, but definitely not FPS, but the FPS games are good for adults and uh, teenagers. I, I would say like 15, 16, 17 would be okay uh, because the FPS games are like giving us that, that opportunity to process lots of visual and auditory information and take a decision in such a short time. And uh, strategy games are giving us a, like they're not that fast. So uh, they're giving us uh, this uh, strategic planning, how to manage resources and what kind of resources we need and uh, how, what kind of uh, proportion we should have in some cases, like we have gold and stone and we think that the gold is more valuable and we get lots of gold. But at a certain point you figure out that you need stones too, right? So to manage that kind of stuff, uh, I think strategy games, but you have to filter out very carefully because a strategy game uh, is, um, it's a kind of sort of storytelling, it's art of storytelling. And uh, you have to pay attention to the story because if the story is not suitable for seven to nine people, seven to nine kids, that's not cool. So uh, pay attention to the story. And it's really nice, like as a parent, if you are a gamer, you know all of those stuff. Like if you can play the game beforehand, would be nice. Uh, uh, if, if not, uh, there are websites. There are websites. Uh, I think Janet mentioned one before. That's about movies. Uh, but about even about the games, you can go online and find the storyline. What kind of storyline is there? If the storyline is uh, children friendly, go ahead. I think strategy games. Uh, just to add to what they said, uh, I don't think everyone's aware. Malinda, when we say FPS, because we are uh, oh, yeah. conversant with the term, so FPS stands for first-person shooter. That's right. But for parents who have absolutely no idea, that's how you you know hold a gun in front of you and go shoot things, right? So that's what Malinda said might not be appropriate. I think one game came into mind. I think since we should give some practical advice, also I think Minecraft is a good game uh, for that age yeah. group because it's a building game, and and I've I mean I have personal experience, so. Uh, I'm in a room where the kid just ran around. He loves Minecraft, right? So uh, there he builds things. And I know for a fact uh, engineers uh, and, and architects who love Minecraft because it's about building things and it generally helps with, with planning and, and all of that. So if your kid is showing any form of affinity towards uh, architecture and building stuff, Minecraft is one great game that you can do. And for casual playing, I think racing games are kind of safe because you don't need for speed. Uh, there's no storyline and you don't have to worry too much. So if they just want to blow off some steam, racing games might also be a safe choice for that age range. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jani. Yes, Mr. Tarindu, would you like to add uh, on? You know, the, uh, the brain development activity game that I was talking about is uh, Elevate. I don't know. Uh, uh, it's a subscription-based game. So, uh, I mean... You, perhaps uh, the parents could experience it themselves. I mean, it'll be helpful for them and then maybe dial down to the, the children. Yeah, that's, that's also an important point uh, that I do because I'm, I have some, I have an Elevate subscription. In Elevate, uh, every day they are giving us a, seri a series of uh, different games to activate different parts of your brain. And that's really fun. Like, it's on your phone, it's giving you a notification. And once you get the notification, 
you can play all of those games. Some of those are memory games. Some of those are problem solving games. And uh, it's stimulating like different parts of your brain. It's really nice. Uh, and uh, mm, then uh, by doing that kind of games and you can uh, trigger those neuron circuits, which we are not really triggering much in day-to-day -day life because we are so, so into routines. So uh, that's nice. Elevate uh, is one good choice. And there are several other uh, brain games as well. If you go to App Store, Google Play Store, and you can find lots of those things. If you go to Elevate and under the Elevate, you have similar apps. You can find lots of those things. And one more, I think I can add this quiz up. Uh, it has math, yeah. science, uh, all of that. I am also uh, addicted to quiz up. So it's, it's a great way because you get to improve your knowledge. You know best way to teach kids of the country's capitals, flags, all of that, they get to play with others. So that's also another safe game I think uh, kids can use. Thank you very much, uh, panel. And I believe uh, there is uh, also an important question that uh, needs to be addressed. I believe uh, these most majority of these questions are directed to uh, the child's health. I believe uh, where Ms. Vanessa is concerned uh, but everybody do uh, add on. Uh, when it comes to uh, one uh, parent uh, asks, uh, how can we keep uh, small children until the online session is over without walking here and there? I think, uh, I believe that this is a question that I know it uh, might seem minor, but definitely we have about, uh, we have a huge majority of parents attending uh, this Zoom session, but a common question I believe needs to be addressed. Yes, Ms. Anderson. Yes. yes, so um, when it comes to, online learning, one of the main factors that affects the effectiveness is the way you deliver the lesson, right? So um, I know I get this question actually from a lot of preschool teachers and even parents most of the time, right? Because they say uh, sometimes what they say is, okay, the online session is more suitable for parents. The parents only do the whatever activities. Right. And in some cases, they say the child would never stay. Right. So when it comes to preschool, uh, you'd have to do a lot of hands on activities. Right. So the session should not just be only like, you know, talk, talk, talk. Right. It should be a session where there is like art and craft. It should be a session where maybe you show them a video, sing a song with them. So you have like a variety of activities that keeps them engaged, right? And of course, again, you need to consider the duration of the session when it comes to preschoolers, right? Unlike primary school, primary school, they might be able to sit and uh, attend to a session for a longer period of time. But a preschooler, right, could do maybe just again, about 30 minutes or less than that. Depends on the activities that you have, right? So um, I think most of it would, um, I think the main factor there is, okay, the teacher, how she delivers the lesson, what are the activities, and that is what would help keep the child engaged. Thank you very much, uh, ma'am. And uh, uh, I have. Uh, I think it's better if we move on to the final question. Do uh, unless any speakers would like to add on. All right. Uh, the final question is actually a com combination of many questions, many uh, concerns these parents have had. Uh, that is, uh, with regards to, I'd like to combine this question a bit uh, so that it makes it broad enough for the panelists to answer. Uh, the first question asks: uh, What is the ideal bit uh, distance between the user and the screen? I believe. Uh, the uh, experts in uh, the uh, media can answer this uh, in this panel. Uh, apart from that, uh, is there a possibility of getting brain injuries or diseases due to the extensive use of the internet slash online learning? There was an article shared on Facebook about a child dying of brain injuries due to extensive online learning. Uh, do these things happen? Are these myths? If so, can these myths uh, be busted today to the panel? Uh, may I start? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the first thing, uh, uh, I'll answer the second part of the question. Uh, because can someone die uh, by looking at a computer screen, a brain injury? I don't really think so. Because you might get some eye strain and uh, you might get eyesight problems. 
that's all that can happen uh, by looking at a computer screen. But uh, I don't really think anyone would die by looking at a computer screen. Maybe uh, there are lots of people who are looking at computer screen and some of them may die due to other causes. And that might look like this person died because he looked at a computer screen. That's possible. That's a statistical pro probability. But other than that, I don't really think anyone would die by looking at a computer screen. And the proper distance, there are some formula, but the easiest thing that you can do is uh, go online and say like safe screen distance or type something like that on Google. And there are some website you can enter the screen size and uh, then you can easily calculate uh, how far you should be from the screen for a movie experience, for reading experience, there are different use cases. So that's the easiest uh, way to find out uh, the distance between you and the screen. Because like, let's say this is my laptop screen when I'm typing something, I can't be this far. I have to like be a little closer to the screen. And uh, when I'm watching a movie or something, then this distance is comfortable. So you have to consider those things. Uh, but uh, I, can, I, I confirm again, I don't really think anyone would die by a brain injury or something by looking at a computer screen. You might get eyesight problem, uh, but I don't really think anyone would die. Vanessa, Janet, I think I think Mahinda answered both those questions uh, succinctly enough that we don't have to answer. Uh, but just to add, I think uh, since we're talking to parents and kids here, the laptop is not the most ideal uh, thing to look at for a long period of time because of how it is, right? In terms of posture, I mean, I, I would mm. never work on a laptop for a long period of time because there's absolutely no physical way you can have good posture while on a laptop. One. So I think, I mean, if, if financial constraints aren't a, aren't a problem, uh, investing in a monitor, you know, you can just plug it into your existing laptop. You don't have to buy a computer, right? So investing in a monitor would definitely benefit kids in terms of posture and, and having the correct uh, distance from the monitor. And I think from what my, um, uh, Malinda said, we have to just understand most of the information that you seek as parents is already available online. Right. It's, it's just a matter of researching. Right? It's great that you're asking this panel, right? But then in terms of the distance from your computer to the, to the eye is, is ready to available online. You have to, it's, as Manin said, it's, it's dependent on the screen size and what you're doing. So you can just Google that. There's a lot you can learn as parents because this vast majority of resources are already available to you. So as parents, I think what we should know is the learning material is there. You have to make the effort to learn. Definitely. Uh, yes, Mr. Yes. So um, when it comes to uh, online learning and the brain, well, okay. But yes, there is substantial amount of research that shows that yes, screen time has an impact on the brain, right? Especially when it comes to areas of creativity, right? And even attention, that's a whole... Uh, another another area which I don't want to go into in depth right now because it's a it's quite a vast topic right and when it comes to um, online learning what what we see is okay there are two um, aspects that I could talk about one is okay excessive screen time can lead to medical conditions like for example maybe the child is seated for hours and hours in front of a screen so it is susceptible to conditions like obesity right, which is commonly seen in children who are addicted to a lot of screen time, right, and even conditions like, um, say, even uh, due to lack of exercise, even things like diabetes, right, there, there could be other con medical conditions that can crop up due to this, as uh, well as now, since uh, Miss, may I uh, shortly uh, intervene uh, quickly just to add yes. on? Uh, yes, uh, sorry, the person who asked the question has just said that the reason for the death was not looking at the screen, but rather wearing the headphones. Yes. Uh, I think uh, if you could add that onto your conversation as well, it would be okay. great. Yes, apologies, miss. Okay, right, no problem, right? So, um, and also, yes, that could be an underlying medical condition, right? As well as another side of online learning is, you know, parents are around, and sometimes there's a lot of work and it causes a lot of stress. So sometimes like the parents say, okay, you got to get this done. Oh my God, this has to be done by before tomorrow, right? Read, do this, learn, learn, right? So that sometimes there's a lot of stress that builds up in the child, 
right? And also, though you're at home, you're actually not on holiday, you're supposed to be at school, right? So, um, because of that, uh, sometimes, like, uh, the articles that I had even seen, there are children, it has, because of surrounding stress levels, it has led to suicide and stuff. There are articles like that, right? So, again, we can't... Uh, directly we can't directly say that okay it was online learning that was solely responsible for this thank you very much uh, ma'am and i believe that uh, uh, with that we are coming in unless the other speakers uh, have to add something uh, yeah just two points uh, because uh, janet said uh, when we are using the laptop, when we keep the laptop on the table and we are working like this is really bad for your back and your neck and everything. So uh, one possible solution is Janet uh, and everyone, uh, we can get a laptop razor. Like you can raise the laptop and there are like small stands. That's not a perfect solution. The best thing is like keep the laptop aside and plug a monitor into the laptop. That's the best solution. And the other thing, uh, someone died by using a headphone. That's what you said, right, Sandro? Yes, yes. Right, uh, that's, that's kind of unbelievable because uh, I'm wearing my headphone like 10 hours every day when I'm editing my videos and I should be dead by now. So I don't really think so because the thing is like now that we are collecting various different like very weird numbers because way more people than usual are connected to computers. They are wearing headphones, they are using internet and people die every day due to various different reasons. And there's a like huge probability that one of those people are looking at the computer screen all the time, wearing headphones all the time. So we think that the cause of death is looking at computer screen or wearing headphones. I kind of decide, I don't really think so. There's such a way for a person to die by headphones, like death by headphones. I don't really think so. Correlation doesn't equate causation. There you go. You said it perfectly. Wise words. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. All right, uh, gentlemen and ladies, thank you very much for uh, joining in. I believe we have come to the end. Thank you very much for to the audience for your wonderful questions. I believe uh, I did uh, due diligence in my duty to answer your deliver your questions to the panel who answered them. Uh, and uh, wrapping up, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Janet, Mr. Malinda, Mr. Tarindu, and also Ms. Vanessa for attending uh, today's session, being the wonderful panelists, adding the amazing insight. And uh, I'd like to remind everybody before we wrap up, once again, to make sure you have enough, uh, enough distance from you and the screens that you use, especially your children. And also make sure your children use the 2020-20 rule as much as they can. 20 second uh, break every 20 minutes and look at 20, something uh, 20 feet far. Thank you very much, uh, uh, the panelists. And uh, this was organized once again, Tech Life by uh, Chocola, the ultimate teen magazine with a readership of over 30,000 individuals in Sri Lanka and also a magazine that has been uh, providing itself in the capacity to forge and increase talents of the youth. Thank you to Chocola for organizing this event as well and for the lovely panelists for attending and also the audience back at home at the safety of your home for attending. Thank you for coming to Tech Life. Thank you, dear panelists. Uh, have a great night and take care.